A question has been popping up more and more on my social feed, the news, among my friends. Should I have kids? Dire warnings from scientists, governing bodies, and the news about the climate crisis devastating effects on humanity are making me question the decision to add another child to a finite planet. Today, the UN said it is already too late. Wouldn't that just deepen the climate crisis? And I, among a lot of people, are concerned about bringing a child into an increasingly hostile world. A recent survey found that about one in four childless adults factored climate change into their decision not to have kids. As someone in a committed partnership, I wanted to dig more into how best to think about this complicated personal question. Is having fewer kids the best answer to ensuring the world will remain a livable one for future generations. I'm Mike, and this is Problem Solved. I contacted Kimberly, a sustainability and climate scientist who has thought a lot about this question, and her answer was actually no. It is true that the number of people on Earth does affect how much climate pollution humanity emits, but it's also true that there's huge carbon inequality in the world today. And 10% of the population emits about half of household climate pollution. In 2017, she co-authored a study that made headlines for its bold conclusion. We found that there are four high impact personal actions that people in industrialized countries can take to reduce their emissions. Going flight, car, and meat free. The fourth action is choosing not to have an additional child. But focusing on this action doesn't tell the whole story. Remember that 10% of high carbon emitters that Kim was talking about? So that's a group that I belong to. If you earn over 38,000 US dollars a year, you're also in that group. And that's the group that needs to work on these high impact climate actions. Which brings us to an increasingly important point, the growing carbon inequality between high and low-income earners. It's true that, on average, per capita emissions for someone in, say, the United States is twice that of someone living in East Asia and 10 times more than someone living in India. That's a pretty damning number. But research shows that emissions generally rise with wealth no matter where you live. For example, some of the richest suburbs in the United States have carbon emissions 15 times the size of less affluent neighboring districts. Look at this chart. The world's top 1% make up 17% of individual carbon emissions, but the bottom 50% make up just 12%. For comparison, 1% of the world's population is roughly 78 million people. 50%? Nearly 4 billion people. It's clear that humans' impact on the planet has less to do with how many of us there are and more with how much and what we consume, which is why Kim chooses to focus on actions. That reduce our current emissions fast and fairly because they target overconsumption and they help promote system change. Really, with a culture of systemic overconsumption comes a culture of systemic wastefulness. Look at the fast fashion industry. Cheap, mass-produced clothes are churned out in exploitative conditions, generating untold amounts of fabric waste and emitting 1.2 billion tons of CO2 per year. That's more than the shipping and aviation industries combined. Or the incredibly insane fact that one-third of food is wasted globally. That's an amount of food that could be used to feed an additional 2 billion people. This means, too, that the resources like chemicals, fossil fuels, and water that went into producing this food are wasted. In the U.S., 25% of all fresh water is used to produce food that is thrown away. Yeah. So yes, while more people on the planet require more clothes and more food and more fuel, we could have more than enough resources to satisfy our needs, and that more people on Earth shouldn't necessarily mean a higher climate impact. In other words, it's not a population issue, but a resource allocation one. It's really clear that the two things humanity has to do to stabilize the climate are to leave fossil fuels in the ground and to develop a relationship that is uh, working with instead of against nature. Switching to clean and renewable energy, reducing overconsumption, and switching to healthy and sustainable diets that are produced in a regenerative way. There's another reason why bringing population into the discussion is a little iffy. I think it has some problematic 
history and connotations when it comes to the personal decision to have a child. And she's totally right. When governments or political figures bring population control into their policies, there's usually some element of racism, xenophobia, or misogyny thrown in the mix. Think of China's one-child policy, where the policy of allowing each family to only have one child led to the rise of forced abortions, abandonment, and the killings of baby girls in the 1990s to early 2000s. Or reports of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement conducting hysterectomies on immigrants in detention centers without their full understanding or consent. There's another reason why focusing on overpopulation ignores our present reality. Global population is expected to peak within this century. A Lancet study suggests it could peak around 9.7 billion people in 2064 and then decline to 8.79 billion in 2100. Fertility has been declining globally since the 1960s. Today, almost half the world's population lives in a country where the fertility rate is below the replacement rate of 2.1 births per mother. Like per capita carbon emissions, however, fertility rates are unequal around the world. Let's return to this map. In developing countries such as Uganda, Afghanistan, and Bolivia, population growth has declined across the last few decades, but is still relatively high. In industrialized high-income nations like Japan, Italy, and Canada, you'll see declining birth rates that are much lower. These countries generally have more accessible contraception and healthcare, higher education levels, and family planning services. As it turns out, when women and girls are empowered and fully engaged in society, they choose to have fewer children and have children later in life. Research has shown that family planning and girls' education have some of the highest potential to reduce greenhouse gases later this century, preventing 68 gigatons of GHGs by 2050. Now, to be clear, Kimberly is not advocating for women's empowerment just to solve the climate crisis. It's a moral imperative in its own right, with the amazing side effect of reducing carbon emissions. So what does this look like in practice? I reached out to Puna Mutreja. She's the executive director of Population Foundation of India, and she's the first to acknowledge that India also has a dark history of population control. In the early years in India, the focus was on sterilizing women which is why PFI's goal isn't to focus on population control, but to focus on women's rights. Social norms did not give the freedom to women to make choices about when they marry, when they have a child, how many children they have. These were freedoms that women had very little of. What PFI has done is to move towards a women's empowerment approach in terms of increasing levels of education. Women not having the not only the autonomy, but access to family planning and other health services. The organization, for example, has set up advanced family planning services in Bihar by sending trained workers to health centers in rural parts of the state to offer on the ground counseling and advice for young couples and families. Adolescent health and education is another core aspect of PFI's work. We are working with adolescents, sexual reproductive health access, understanding, making choice, and the mental well-being of young people. According to PFI, investing in adolescent sexual and reproductive health programs in Rajasthan, one of the states that PFI works in, can avert 1.5 million unwanted births by 2025. This is Mossum, a youth advocate who works with PFI. She helps PFI facilitate meetings for other adolescents in her village, providing information on family planning, reproductive health, contraception, and more. कि गांव में शहर में भी ज्यादा तब लोग हैं वो ये नेचुरल है कि लड़का को लड़की की ओर आकर्षण और लड़के को लड़की की ओर आकर्षण तो अगर उन्हें फैमिली प्लानिंग की जानकारी है तो उसे किसी तरीके का अगर अट्रैक्शन होता है या कुछ भी होता है वो खुद को संभाल सकते हैं और इसका इस्तेमाल कर सकते हैं तो वो ज्यादा बेहतर हो सकता है सो दैट व्हेन पीपल आर रेडी टू हैव अ चाइल्ड दे कैन जब तक मैं पूरी तरीके से तैयार हूं जब तक मेरे दोनों में मेरे में हस्बैंड 
अभी क्लियर ना हो जाए तब तक मैं बच्चा नहीं आई एम अ प्राउड मदर ऑफ टू चिल्ड्रन नोबडी एक्सेप्ट द वुमन एंड हर फैमिली हैज द राइट टू डिसाइड बट द फाइनल राइट इज विद द वुमन आई बिलीव The personal decision to have a child is a fundamental human right. And so is the decision not to. I remember really wrestling with the decision especially when I moved from one child to two. This is Megan, a climate change journalist who has written about the decision to have children, which for her wasn't easy. The reason why I chose to have children, I felt ready at that point in my life to to build an intentional family to surround myself with you know joy and fullness i do believe that i would make a different decision today or i would certainly think about it with different inputs if we're wrestling with the decision today as someone who's engaged in the future of our planet megan's advice is to be really intentional about why you want a kid i encourage people to connect deeply with their reasons for wanting to have a child not just considering it you know a, a part of a life path or a foregone conclusion With the rising cost of childcare, education, insufficient parental leave at least in the US, and an unfair burden placed usually on the mother, it's paramount to thoroughly consider and evaluate one's unique life circumstances and support systems to help you and to champion systems that increase this support, not restrict it. Having honest conversations about our resources and how we can be more supportive for people who are thinking about starting families or who are thinking about more progressive models about intentional community or you know different ways of assembling a family unit or a cooperative unit being more open minded and supportive of those it seems to me that the answer to should i have children might just be yes if you want to but it helps to really think about it before you do which i have to acknowledge is an incredibly privileged position to be in and it really seems to me that we want to do everything we can to protect the right for people to make that choice for themselves. Linking population to climate mitigation strategies is not the way to think about it. The key to determining a more livable future is ensuring more equitable consumption patterns and resource allocation, eradicating fossil fuels and investing in female empowerment around the world. Yes, the climate crisis requires systemic change, which is nudged along by governments, corporations and large-scale cultural shifts. At times it seems an insurmountable challenge but at the core of these systems are people we are our best chance of salvation the decision to have a child is a fundamental human right that needs to be at the core of what we want to protect from climate breakdown and it's a reason to fight so hard to make the changes necessary in the narrowly closing window that we actually have to do that instead of misanthropy we can instead support each other and the next generation to implement solutions to deal with this crisis together. <laughs>